Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another webinar from the Brain Aneurysm Foundation. Tonight, we have Dr. Michael Chen from the Department of Neurosurgery at Rush University Medical Center. Um, he does endovascular treatment of uh, cerebral aneurysm. He's an expert in many topics. However, he, tonight, he's going to focus his attention on the topic of the relationships of the estrogens and formation and pathogenesis of cerebral aneurysms. This is a relatively controversial topic, however, it's very important, and I really appreciate his opinion. Michael, thanks again, and please go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Cohen, and thanks everybody for uh, attending tonight. Uh, I also want to start off by thanking the Brain Aneurysm Foundation for their general support through the research grant to be able to provide so much critical support. Much of this would not be possible at all. And obviously, I'd like to thank all the people that I work with here at Rush for, for all, you know, everything that's involved. So much collaboration is necessary. So I'm really uh, very appreciative of the interest in this topic of estrogen and brain aneurysms. It's something that I've spent the last few years on and hopefully been able to find uh, some interesting findings that might be useful to all of you attending tonight and hopefully, more importantly, lead us towards finding more effective therapies potentially in the future for women with brain aneurysms. So let's just get started here. Um, aneurysms, as everyone attending probably is fully aware of, are a problem of the blood vessels, namely the arteries, are, which are muscular vessels which transmit blood pumped by the heart to the cells of the brain. The main reason why we worry about aneurysms is if they ever would rupture, it would lead to blood under pressure entering the spinal fluid space that normally surrounds the brain. These are examples of what aneurysms can look like. You can see very several times larger than the normal diameter of the artery that arises from. And this is an example of a normal CT scan of the brain. This dark area here represents spinal fluid, which is normal. And this is blood in the spinal in the cerebrospinal space of the subarachnoid space which represents bleeding from an aneurysm. And unfortunately, it can be a life-threatening situation, such as in this patient. He can see severe compression and, and pressure on important uh, brain uh, vital structures that are important for, for normal reflexes. So up until the 1990s, brain aneurysms only came to medical attention after they had ruptured. But only recently, with the increased use and availability of non-invasive brain vascular imaging, have we seen a greater incidence of aneurysms being detected before rupture. And autopsy studies suggest that about 3 to 5 percent of the U.S. population have brain aneurysms. If you take the U.S. population to be about 300 million, that's about 9 million people. Meanwhile, 40,000 people each year, at least in North America, develop bleeding from aneurysms. And so obviously there's a big discrepancy in and who may have problems with this down the road. And it oftentimes is a very big management conundrum in terms of deciding whether or not to proceed with treatment. These are examples of non-invasive blood vessel, brain blood vessel imaging. This on the right is a CT angiogram demonstrating a posterior commissioning artery aneurysm. Here's an MR angiogram, MRA. And um, the majority of these visits right now really, in terms of the brain aneurysm experts, usually a surgeon of some sort or a proceduralist. And the emphasis on the discussion oftentimes focuses on whether or not the aneurysm should be anatomically excluded. So this includes potentially open surgery or endovascular treatment. And uh, these procedures obviously entail serious risks. So, Some of these procedures, as everybody here is probably aware of, is a clip placement, where a clip is brought to reuppose the normal wall of the artery to sort of uh, basically cut off the blood supply to the, to the dome of the aneurysm. Then you have endovascular procedures, where microcatheters are advanced through a small incision and the crease in the leg and the artery and the groin to basically seal off the aneurysm dome by placing soft uh, platinum coils. And even more recently, you have flow diverters, which are high-density stent-like devices which preferentially keep blood flow within the normal artery. But um, what we found, though, recently, like I mentioned before, because of the increased use of imaging, 
is that you have an increase